So without further ado, I shall uh, welcome Ruth and Jürgen to share right. their story. Okay. <laughs> I must say, um, it's wonderful to be here. And I love the setting. Normally, there's a stage and goodness knows what else. This is really my cup of tea, you know, sitting around comfortably and looking at people and they looking at me. And I hope at the end you will ask questions. Yeah? Uh, anything, we're here just for one evening. We make ourselves available. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk, or perhaps we're going to talk on the uh, Holocaust. The Holocaust, the Shah, it's known. Yeah? And I'm taking you back to the 1930s, unfortunately. 1930s in Germany was not a good decade. I was born in 1935 in Germany. It wasn't a good year. But we'll go, go there and then we'll take you safely back to Colville. So please, you know, I want to be back. I would love to be. My husband just met me going along there and he said, I've just signed up, signed us up for life members here in Colville. <laughs> so I'm really pleased about that. Um, we're going to go straight into this PowerPoint. And I've called this the heavens wept initially. But now I've changed it to the heavens weep. If we think about all the atrocities that are going on now, the Ukraine and other places, Syria, uh, it's not the heavens wept just for the Shoah, just for the Holocaust. The heavens weep now for what's going on. It's not a good time, is it? Uh, so there I've done a painting in acrylic and the black is the tears of the heavens. I I've tried to do my work in glass because you'll see why later on. My parents never told us about their time in Germany. For them, it, it was taboo to tell the children. Yeah? So I've had to imagine their lives, not only imagine, we've got lots of letters from them and also archives. I built up the jigsaw Life is a jigsaw, isn't it? Uh, a jigsaw of our lives, my parents' life, uh, and through my work in glass and paintings. How I imagined their lives to be. I didn't have any, they didn't inform me about anything. I came over with a kinder transport at the age of four, uh, fostered, put in a, a, an orphanage, fostered, and didn't see my parents for some time. So they wanted, when they came over to England, they wanted to start their lives afresh. I think you'll all understand that. Let's move on to the next one, please. Here you see a little bit about, my name was Auerbach, and then it became Schwening. I thought when I was young, I wanted a simple name like Smith or Brown, but I ended up with Schwening. Blame my husband. Um, <laughs> My grandmother's Henrietta Auerbach was deported from Breslau to Theresienstadt. Theresienstadt was a concentration camp. Yeah? As well uh, as a ghetto. As well as a ghetto. Yeah, you'll find this is like the two Ronnies. <laughs> we, we kind of. <laughs> no. I, when my husband speaks too much, I give him a little kick. And <laughs> okay, so she went to Theresienstadt. You'll see a picture of her soon, I hope, if we've got the right PowerPoint. Uh, and the Laura Ring was deported to Theresienstadt. That's my mother's mother. So I never knew grandmothers. I never knew, I never had grandmothers. When I became a grandmother, I didn't know how to behave. I went around in jogging trousers and trainers. <laughs> and that's not what grandmas do, is it? So, also, she was in concentration camp at the age of 77. That is no age at all, is it now? The age of 77. Now, also, my aunt, Friederike Auerbach, that was my father's sister, was deported from Breslau. I was born in Breslau, which is now in Poland. We visited 
it, not too long ago. Um, and she died in a place unknown. Probably, we don't know, but there was no trace of her after the war. She was declared dead on the 8th of May. But we can imagine she was killed at the end. Yeah, she was the same age as my other grandmother. And I don't, I won't use the word died. I don't like to use euphemisms. Most of these people didn't just die, they were killed in one way or another. Yeah, next one please. There you see my aunt, a young woman in the heyday of her life, the heyday. She was 44 when she was taken away and deported to, uh, we think, we, we don't know exactly where. We've looked at archives, uh, the Vienna, Vienna Library, but we don't know. A beautiful young woman, her life was snuffed out by uh, the Holocaust. Next one, please. They're the two grandmothers. Did they know, had they, they're pretty well dressed, jewellery, had they known that one day they might be driven from their home, their flats, and driven by probably cattle truck to a concentration camp, dressed in rags, had they known that? They might have, as many others did, committed suicide. That might have been an easier way out for them, but they didn't know. This is a picture, and probably this, I did this in glass, uh, and it is a picture of uh, my parents in love. 1930, in Germany, uh, earlier than that, they were, first of all, good friends. My father studied at Breslau University. He wanted to be a doctor, but he didn't achieve that, and so he decided instead to go to farming. And he, were, he was a farmer in Breslau, uh, and that is where they met. So this is probably my favourite picture, showing the love between them. Yeah? One in glass, one has got the arm around the other. Let's go on to the next one, please. This is the farm, the first farm that they actually, my father built that farm. Yes, so uh, they were very happy here. Yeah? Um, they built their own farm, and in 1933, uh, my first, my brother was born, uh, and 1935, I was born and had a twin brother. Yeah? So, what could be better? Positive, yes, they did see certain clouds on the horizon, but as many Germans did, they thought these clouds would pass by, and things would normalize themselves. And here I just have to mention very quickly, uh, go back in time. And we must, Hitler wrote a book. Does anybody know the name of the book? Mein Kampf. Great. Um, you know your history, <laughs> I have to be careful. Um, <laughs> mein Kampf. And in that book, Mein Kampf, he wrote quite Clearly, in 1922 or 23, he wrote quite clearly what he wanted to do with these Jews. He wanted to have a pure race of Aryans in the country. He wanted to get rid of the Jews. That was already in 1925. We're now moving on to 1933. 1933, he declared that no Jew was to own land or to own a farm. My parents had that. So they managed to, because they were out in the sticks, they managed to stay on their farm with the children until 1936. 1936, their existence was taken away from them. It became quite clear to my parents then that Germany had very little to offer them, as indeed many other Jews. But 1933, 1935, 1936, it might have been possible for some people to emigrate. Yeah? Although the uh, 
persecution of the Jews had already started, the people who were far-sighted decided they might be able to emigrate early. My parents weren't amongst them. Uh, so now, in 1936, their existence taken away from them, their, all the persecution, their doctors, uh, dentists, uh, civil servants, uh, were all made without a job. No existence for them. <laughs> Jews became second-class citizens. Their statementship, and this was a step by step. It didn't happen all immediately. It was just a step-by-step -step existence, taking away various things, taking away children from schools. Now imagine if you've got a child at the school. The child comes home and says to the mummy or daddy, I'm not allowed to go to that school anymore. And the child doesn't know why. The child comes th past the park and sees perhaps a sign or hears, no Jews allowed to sit here. No Jews allowed to go swimming. No Jews allowed to go into the parks. What do you tell your child? What do you tell your child? It's a question that I'm asking you to think about. Yeah? Can I just say a word about emigration? Let's leave that until, yeah, if you don't mind. Let's move on, please. <laughs> Uh, yes, there's so much we would like to tell you, and time seems to be so short, really. Maybe we could come back some other time, because there's so much, really, that happens after we came to England uh, uh, as refugees. Here is a picture. I never knew anything about my childhood, where I was born, what it was like. We all like to think back, don't we? And, uh, you know, when my husband or uh, a friend says, yes, this is the house where I was born, or this is the area where I was born. I'm very quiet, because I have nothing to say. I've seen the house on postcards, but only on postcards. And one day I said, I want to be like everybody else. I want to go and see the place where I was born, or near there. And this is the house then uh, I painted in acrylics. Next one, please. Here is my uh, father. You see my father, the guy with the hat on there in the middle, looking down. Yeah? He, um, he's got leg warmers on as well, hasn't he? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't noticed that before. <laughs> um, there he is then, a proud man. And he's there together with uh, his men. And these young men are being trained to go to Palestine, which is now, of course, you all know is Israel, yeah? So he taught them. And next one, please, you'll soon see another one. There's my father as a young man, a handsome young man with my uh, brother on the horse, yeah? He was happy. He was happy. He realized his dream. Nothing could go wrong, he thought. But, but, remember, he was Jewish. But was he Jewish? He was German. He was German first and foremost. He was German, uh, not Jewish. Although recently we've been reading some letters and up till now we haven't realized how Jewish he actually was. Uh, you know, you get, you read in between the lines and we know he was Jewish as well as, but mainly German. If somebody asks you, uh, what are you are, you will say British. Yes. You won't say Christian or Muslim, you'll say British, won't you? The same as my parents said German. Somebody asked me wh uh, what I am, I'll say British. Next one, please. Now, these are the three young men who were uh, taught to go to, how to get knowledge of the land and go to Palestine. And this one with the braces, I love him. He is, um, he Gerhard. must have been, Gerhard, yes. He must have been about 15, 16, perhaps not quite that age. Um, and he actually followed my father to Austria where they went eventually. Um, we got in touch with his, how did you get in touch with him? Sister. Yeah, with his sister, and she was in Israel. And we sent an electronic picture Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold. And uh, said, um, 
do you know this young guy? And she wrote back, I could imagine her in tears, and she said, yes, that was my brother. And I know, I know now how happy he was uh, working together with my father, my father. Uh, what happened to him? Uh, and she said, this is a mitzvah. Now, a mitzvah in Hebrew means a blessing. And she said, I can die in peace now because I know that my brother was happy. We don't know what happened to him at the end. Uh, we know that he accompanied my father to Austria and he worked for a time there. Um, let's move on then. Now, I said I work in glass. That is one of my pieces there. And um, this shows when they moved, had to move because their existence had been taken away from them, their house was in chaos. And I don't know how familiar you are, you are with Chagall. I love the painter Chagall. It's dreamlike figure co colors. And even though it's sad what you want to express, you can express it in the colors, yeah? and each colour will have a meaning. Um, now, you notice I've done with that uh, a house in the air, uh, a cow, because he loved his cows, uh, a cow going off the picture, and usually I, a boat, because I came over on a boat, the kinder transport and a boat. So these my pictures usually have these things on them, a bird, usually a menorah, and uh, a boat. Next one, please. Here, it tells you a little bit. I'm not expecting you to read all those, but remembering it is a step-by-step-by-step -by -by -step persecution of the Jews and their rights taken away from them. Um, 19, I would like you to look at the... This was the entailed farm law, states that only German citizens of German blood can be farmers, yeah? My father was a farmer, yeah? Farmers were considered the blood spring of the folk, Blut and Bolden, blood and earth, 1933. They managed to stay on their farm in Esdorf until 1936. Jewish law students at university excluded from examination, yeah? Let's move on to the next one because the next one is all Jewish children excluded from state schools. Can I, can I interrupt now because... <laughs> okay. <laughs> smile. We must smile, mustn't we? Because that's part of life, part of living. Um, what I wanted to do, can we just go back one, please? Right, now, what I wanted to do is for you to look at the main thing that really upsets me. And I think it would upset you as well. The Nuremberg Laws, full citizenship restricted to people of German blood. Marriages between Jews and Aryans are forbidden. I'm a Jew. My husband would be classed as an Aryan. Had we wanted to get married in that time, it would have been forbidden. Why? What, what is that all about? This is one of the laws that hit me hardest, I think, to forbid lovers to live together and to marry and to be happy together. So that is in Nuremberg Laws and also the removal of citizenship. If you are no longer a citizen of the country, you are nothing. You have no means to exist. You can't vote. You can do nothing at all. You've got no money. Full citizenship taken away from Jews. But now I mention Jews, and it makes me very much aware 
that there were not only the Jews who were persecuted, there were the, we call them gypsies. I don't like that name. It's a derogative. We mustn't. Uh, the Romani people. That's in future. If we're talking about this group of people, let's call them Romani. Yeah? Okay, let's move on then. No, I wanted just to mention, <laughs> and I'm sorry, it's, I'm not looking at notes or anything, I'm just talking free because that's the way we do it. Um, Hitler Youth, when you were age, boys were the age of 10, they had to, they had to join the Hitler Youth. Now, Jürgen was, lived in Germany at that time, and for a very short time, he was a member of the Hitler Youth. The Hitler Youth, the young boys of um, 10, 10, were indoctrinated for, to, and I'm quoting now part of what's said in the laws, eternally hate the Jews, eternally hate the Jews, young boys of 10 were ordered to do that. Uh, it was mainly, um, I have uh, an idea now what happened, and it's mainly, and I must say quite sincerely, that it's thanks to Jürgen. He spent hours, he spent years, finding out what happened to my life. And really, it is Jürgen's hard work that's done that, that I can actually stand here today and tell you uh, some details of my life. Uh, then my parents, realising that life in Germany wasn't for them anymore. But my father was very positive. He thought this would all blow over. After time, we will be able to get back to Germany and be able to be with uh, the parents and with the friends and with everything, the culture was very important to my mother. Uh, books were so much, uh, meant so much to her. But, and they decided then, Austria. The, I think, we think, that they chose Austria because it was uh, on the border of Germany. And also the language was the same. They found a farm, again, uh, far away from anywhere uh, in Austria, uh, and they bought it. How they bought it, I don't know. We think that my uh, uncle gave them some money. And also they had some money from the farm that they sold. So this farm was pretty, yes. Ah, why they went to Austria, of course, I've forgotten to mention, so important that Austria was an independent country. Yeah, so um, they thought, yes, okay, it's independent. What's happening in Germany won't happen in Austria. But in actual fact, what happened in Germany happened in Austria even worse. Anti-Semitism was rife with a big R. They took it more seriously than perhaps the Germans did. And now my parents were in Austria on the farm, very positive people. Would we have been so positive? I often try to think what I might have done had I been in the shoes of my parents. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and so they went to Austria and they bought uh, this farm, Hörsel. Uh, there my mother at the, and Peter, Peter my brother at the pump. You can't see that very well. It's a very old photograph. Um, I'm standing in the middle, so. Uh, the other picture shows you my mother in the middle and two ladies who probably helped her in the house. Yeah, and then the, we three children are at the front. And probably, I think I'm the one with the muff, I think. Oh, of course I am. <laughs> okay, I'm the one, I'll say it more positive. Do you mind holding it up? Um, and uh, Michael is, my twin, is next to me. Peter is at the back. 
Now, we have numerous pictures, photos of my parents when they lived in the other farm in Estorf. This is probably the last picture and very, very few pictures of the farm here and uh, of us children. Why? We couldn't work out, first of all, why there are so few pictures of that place. And then we suddenly realised, reflecting on when we take photographs and when you take photographs, you probably you take photographs when you're happy, don't you? You don't take photographs when you're sad or feeling ill or feeling off colour. You take photographs when you're happy. And this is probably the last photograph of us as a family. My father isn't there. He might have taken a photograph. Uh, let's move on to the next one, please. That is my, uh, myself. Yes, what happens between then and now? I don't know. I don't. Perhaps they call it age. I don't know. I hope you are photographing and taking all the wrinkles out of you. Uh, so that is me and my twin brother, Michael. Yeah? Probably one of the last photographs taken before we have to leave. Next one, <coughs> next one, please. Now, this is the house. Again, it's a place I wanted to see. Recent, not too recently, about... Oh, yes, we've been there last year. Uh, I wanted to see yeah, this place. Three times, twice. three times. When we went there, though, the first time, before we went, something very interesting happened. The people were really worried about us coming over. The same with the other farm in Poland. They were really worried. You, can you imagine why? Exactly. They thought we would come to reclaim it. We had no such intention, but they were worried. In the meantime, we went this year or last, last year, and we still in touch with the younger generation there, and everything is smooth running there. Of course, we weren't going to reclaim it. We just wanted to try and rekindle a memory of mine which was lost. Yeah. So this is the farm, beautiful farm now, uh, and let's move on to the next one, please. This is when the catalyst happened. Uh, the n pogrom of 9th and 10th of November, the Kristallnacht. Crystal, crystal. Sounds beautiful. It is beautiful. I haven't got any, uh, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. You hold it up to the light and it shines, doesn't it? It's all beautiful colours and uh, the sun comes through it. Uh, it's not like that at all. The night of the crystal, the night of the broken glass. Uh, there we are. Let's move on, please. I did a picture, an acrylic picture, h how I imagined the Kristallnacht to be. And when I did this picture, I did it in a uh, fury. I chucked paint at it. I used my palette knife. I used a knife. I used colours. To me, it was a, an expression of what was in my heart and what was in my soul. And these things stay with you. Yeah? I was angry. Of course I was angry. Because this, the Kristallnacht, was the night which changed the whole of my life, the whole of my parents' life, the whole of thousands, millions of people's lives, not only Jews, Romani and various other people, people who were disabled, euthanized. Of course I was angry. Uh, let's move on. And if you looked at that picture, it looks a joyful, it looks a great picture, doesn't it? Fireworks, happy times. But to me, it means a lot more than that. Next one, please. Oh, no, this one. Here you see the burning synagogues. On the Kristallnacht, the night after the Kristallnacht, synagogues were burned. People were thrown down the, the stairs uh, with the wheelchairs. Men were driven out on the streets. Hair was shaven off the men. Beards were shaven off. They were given small brushes in which to uh, clean the roads and people stood by. And these are the bystanders, the bystanders who saw but didn't help. 
we are the motto of this year's um, Jewish monu um, memorial is ordinary people. How far were ordinary people involved in what happened in Germany in the 1930s? Ordinary people were involved, the bystanders as well, when they saw and spat at the men who were kneeling on the streets outside, cleaning the street. Right, next one, please. This, I'm not going to show you concentration camps or anything like that, uh, but this is a picture of my father was taken after Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. There was a knock on the door and at the farm and my father, somebody stood there and said, are you the Jew Auerbach? Not are you Mr. Auerbach, are you the Jew Auerbach? My father said, yes, come with us. And they put him on a lorry and took him away. He had no time to say, uh, to kiss his children, to say shalom to his wife. No time. They just took him. His wife, my mother, didn't know where they were taking him. Had no idea. She didn't even know whether she would see him again. <coughs> when I look at that one, I often think, well, is my father amongst them? because my father was taken to Dachau concentration camp where he stayed for six weeks. Now you think six weeks is a very short time. You be in a concentration camp for six weeks and you, you don't come out of it as a man you went in, guaranteed, and neither did my father. Um, let's move on to the next one, please. This is the concentration, uh, Germans are very meticulous in keeping details this is a layout of the concentration camp in Dachau, the concentration camp my father was in. And here it shows you exactly the bunks uh, the men slept in. Slept is a bunk. Right, OK, let's move on then, please. Now, this again is a piece of glass. As I said, my parents didn't tell me anything at all. Uh, I once asked my father, and I remember this as though it was yesterday, and it still hurts. Um, it all hurts, actually, and then, you know, your memory, as you get older, you begin to think more about what happened in the past. Um, and this is in glass. Uh, <coughs> whilst in Dachau concentration camp, my father wrote to my mother saying, I can work, can't I? They could send cards. My father wrote three cards in concentration camp. I did this piece of work in the shape of a woman uh, because I don't think women are given enough credit for having helped their husbands, their brothers, their uncles, their sons, <coughs> whilst they're in concentration camp. They didn't. 
uh, give not enough credit on the whole has been given to them. Yes, we're getting it now, the the involvement, of course. So I thought I'd do it in the shape, and women were taken out to concentration camps as well. We mustn't forget that. And um, here I did a woman uh, with broken glass, broken pieces there, because I worked in glass. Why did I work in glass? I worked in glass because glass sh uh, shatters. Glass can glass is fragile. Love is fragile. Life is fragile. So I thought the best thing, it all shatters, it all explodes, as it did with my parents. Uh, so I thought this is the best way of working in telling my parents' story. Right, next one, please. Again, this is in glass. Here I did uh, a skull. Yeah? A skull, and it takes uh, the uh, young lady there works in glass, you will understand. It's not easy. Sometimes it takes three firings, and each firing, if you open the kiln too soon, it shatters. Yeah? Like life can like my parents' life did. Yep. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Here, when my father was taken from concentration camp, uh, my mother did had no idea what was happening, and she looked out of the window the next day, <coughs> and she saw her pet dog had been shot. So uh, I just had to represent this with a lead that is broken. How do you tell? How do you tell your children? How do you tell your children why your dog is lying on the ground not moving? How do you? How do you tell your children where their father has gone when he's disappeared? I think we need to think about these things. Yes, it's a hypothetical question, but and let's hope it will never happen again. But we have to think about these things. Uh, let's move on to the next one, please. My father, when he was into, uh, on the pr way to prison, why did he go to prison after he, from his farm? They took him to prison. Why did they take him to prison? An innocent man who'd done nothing, who'd harmed nobody. Why did they take him to prison? Because he was a Jew. That's why. Okay, so here he wrote, writes, uh, mention your handicap. I didn't mention this, that my mother had polio when she was a young woman, and uh, this uh, incapacitated her with walking. So this is another thing that we have to think about. Here's a woman uh, hardly being able to walk with three little children to look after, husband in the concentration camp. What now? Situation in Austria equal to the situation in Germany, getting worse and worse. What <coughs> now? Uh, so that's a card. And he says, and ask for my release. Ask for my release. Right, next one, please. Um, you're allowed to send cards. You were allowed to send cards uh, and uh, of 10 lines. Of course, they were censored. So when he, he writes, I'm OK, that's probably after a beating on the uh, courtyard in the morning, one of the punishments. If you move or if you don't do something correctly, uh, you punish, you stand there for 24 hours and flogged or something. I'm not going to go into that. Um, address it to me correctly and kisses from your loving Lothar, Dachau, the 19th of November. We have these cards. They're so important, aren't they? And they will go to an archive, I hope either to my children, if, me, if our children want them, but otherwise to uh, Bet Shalom, the Holocaust Museum, or somewhere in our card. And this is then his card he wrote. And also, take the double plough in. This shows how he was a, worked on the land and how he loved his farm. Take, he was taken away in the winter and drain the water, get somebody to drain the water out of the tractor. Next one, please. Uh, I'm very worried since I'm so far without news. He hopes everything's all right. Now, 
he's telling his wife, um, contact Mostar, Mostar or Finn immediately to be able to stay there until you get the permit. Prepare everything for the sale, even if the price is low. And in the meantime, when my father was taken to concentration camp, two weeks, two weeks afterwards, the uh, official came to him, came to my mother and said, or wrote a letter and said, you've got to leave the farm. You've got to get on the train there. Sorry? Yeah, OK. Uh, you've got to leave the farm, take everybody who is Jewish with you, that is uh, the three children, and go to Vienna. My mother was a very clever woman, <coughs> very astute. She thought, had she gone to Vienna, I wouldn't be standing here. I would have probably ended up in, in Auschwitz or a concentration camp. Here I am, though, right? Due to my mother. And instead of going to Vienna, which was the hub of the Jews, you know, the Jews, and most of them then were, we know what that means, transported. We know what that means. Um, and she went to Berlin. She went to Berlin, where she had relations and friends. In the meantime, though, there were three children, a woman all on her own, husband in concentration camp. Take the next slide. <laughs> next slide, please. Ah, that is the expulsion order, yeah? Um, in the meantime, yeah, look at the date. If you move to Vienna, you must report on your arrival to the appropriate police station. Uh, by order of the state police in Klangford, we have to inform you that you and your family, insofar as they are Jews, have to emigrate. No country wanted us. No country wanted little Ruth. No country wanted this brave woman. Why? Well, several reasons why they didn't want the... It's the same as in England, isn't it, when we think of the Poles who came over. We didn't really want them because we thought that they would take away our houses. We thought that they would take away our jobs. We thought that they rape our children. Whilst my father was in concentration camp, <coughs> sorry, the, um, and my mother was given the order to go to Vienna and she decided no, she wouldn't go to Vienna, she would go to Berlin. The Jewish organization who were, before that I need to very quickly say, uh, you saw the fire in the synagogues, yeah? You saw the destruction, you heard the, about the destruction. Who was to blame for that? Who was to blame for setting the synagogues, throwing people down, killing, murdering people? Who was to blame? Hitler, Pardon? Hitler, Hitler. Who did they think that the German, the Hitler's troop blamed? The Jews. The Jews, of course, were responsible for all this, they said. And they had to pay fines. They had to pay a lot of money because the Jews were responsible. You wouldn't believe it, would you? Anyway, um, whilst my father was in concentration camp, the Jewish organization somehow contacted my mother and said, you've got three children, Hilda. My mother's name was Hilda. We will help you. Uh, because you have your husband in a uh, concentration camp, you will have the privilege, you are privileged, we will help you, we will take one child, and we can only take one child, and we will take that child to, uh, the, on the kinder transport. The kinder transport, England did. We don't think it's that wonderful, but at least they did promise to take 10,000 children um, to England yeah, and keep them safe. Which child now, Hilda, my mother, thought, how would you say, which child, you've got three children and you love them equally, which child, you have to make Solomon's choice, which child do you give up? 
knowing in your mind that you might never see that child again? What do you pack when you send this child away? Anyway, let's move on. Uh, they said, well, we'll take the girl, that is me. We'll take her and she will then go on the kinder transport, the children's transport, and we will take her with us to England. But first of all, first of all, she'll have to go into an orphanage. So I was put in an orphanage. I was taken away from my mother, taken away from my brothers, and put in an orphanage for a time, and travelled then uh, to England on the kinder transport. We haven't got much time to tell you about the kinder transport, but let's go on. Um, my father's card from Dachau was forwarded to my mother in Berlin. <laughs> but it wasn't as generous as we think. It wasn't. The people who, firstly, getting a visa. You know, we, the Ukrainians, they have to get visas. You think they just go to the counter and there they are, an official them there and saying, yeah, I want a visa. It doesn't work like that. It takes weeks and weeks and weeks. And in the meantime, people are hungry. People are dying on the streets. People are in uh, tents. What are we doing? And at that time, the people who wanted to foster me and wanted to foster other children had to pay a sum of 50 pounds. Now, that 50 pounds was a lot of money at that time. Yeah? And why was the money there? To make sure that they, when things had settled in Germany, they could go back again. It was a kind of deposit. Yeah? Uh, so it wasn't quite as it seems to be. It wasn't quite as rosy and as well-meaning uh, as we think that the British were. There were also difficulties when the child went to, along the street and said to, knocked on the door and said to somebody there, will you, take, will you get a visa for my mother? or for my father, not for my father so much, but for my mother or for my little sister, <coughs> went begging. It was not that easy. So anyway, uh, where are we now? We are here, the card went to Berlin, and uh, then we always think that people are keeping it, kept in concentration camps. No, they weren't. They, the German uh, Reich there, what they wanted was the, to get the... Jews and others, Romani and others, out of the country. This idea of a gas chamber wasn't really in play at that time. So they had a conference at Vanze, the Vanze conference, and that is when they decided, yeah, the Jews aren't getting out of the country quick enough, we'll have to do something. And that is when the extermination of so many Jews, so many uh, Romani, so many um, different handicapped people or disabled people took place. That is, and we always think, yes, okay, they were all gassed. No, they weren't all gassed. They were shot. They were taken into the forest. Uh, uh, ditches were dug and they were shot and they fell into the ditch. Okay, uh, let's move on, please. Here is a, a startling picture of how uh, Christians helped my parents, people in the next farm helped my parents to get out. They came to my mother and said, look, we'll help you, Hilda. How can you help me? Yeah, well, we're neighbours. We'll get a horse and cart and we will take you to the next station and then you can get a train to Berlin and we'll cover you, put you in the cart and maybe the boys as well and we'll take you to the station and we'll cover you with straw and we'll drive you there and then you can go on your way. Okay? And that there were good people. We can't, we can't think that all Germans were bad at that time. There were people who were willing to help. Right, next one, please. This is the one I've brought here. Uh, this is in glass, three firings, 
you do yours in three firings? Three firings. And um, the idea of the figure that is driving the um, Jews and other people out of the country, that is um, the, the figure there is Germany. OK, next one, please. Here, again, I have something about women are not being credited enough for their help. Here I've painted the picture of women waiting day and night, night and day, for a visa to get their uh, fellow, their husbands, out of the country. And this one is in a big canvas, big, much bigger than that, um, which my daughter's got now. Right, next one, please. Uh, yes, we have the um, passport of my father, and there you notice on the passport is a big J, yeah? And this was for uh, officials to know where, if they go th somewhere important, they always have to carry their passport and they know that they were Jews. And also the name, men had to take a middle name, Israel, and uh, in between, because it didn't... Uh, if they didn't have a name which indicated they were Jewish, they had to then have the name Israel put in the middle. Uh, and the women had to have the name Sarah, Sarah, put in the middle. And immediately the official people standing there would know that they were Jewish and act accordingly. Right, next one, please. Uh, my ups I did this in chalk and charcoal. My upside down world, the dreams of a happy life in Germany were destroyed. Yeah, I did it in chalk and charcoal on paper, and there it shows a figure upside down, the menorah upside down, the bird upside down, uh, the violin, no, the violin music is something for pleasure, isn't it? Uh, no more music, uh, the violin is broken. Right, next one, please. Uh, turbulence. My parents' lives had been turbulent, but they weathered the storm. They came to England, we met up again. I don't know if this is the last one. We, we met up again in England eventually, eventually. Uh, next one, please. A broken tree, a broken life. I did this in chalk and charcoal. A grandmother, my grandmother, I don't know what became of her. So I did a picture of how I imagine. It's funny, isn't it? My mother never taught, neither did my father talk about his parents or her parents. Never described them to me or what they did or how they looked, really. Which is a shame, isn't it, if uh, this isn't done. Next one, please. Freedom. They got to England, to a country where they didn't ask about your religion. Yeah? They didn't ask if you're, a, are you Jewish? Yeah? They just accepted in a way they accepted us as we were and as that we are. At that time, it was more of a handicap to be German than yeah. to be Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'd, I'd like you to imagine <coughs> that. Yeah. You, we are now, not now, but then, in a country which we are fighting. So, um, it wasn't an easy time for my parents. I've got a little green book there which was brought out for... Uh, the Jews when they came over, refugees, which I was, very poor. People can't imagine that now. Uh, very poor and very dis... We didn't have a home. My p mother came over without my father with one suitcase. A bit like the Ukrainians are doing now. I, I, you know, I gave a little talk to show them my daughter has hosted Ukrainians and I showed the lady a picture and she burst out into tears and she said this is just what we're experiencing now um, and anyway so they were freedom we were as children the story goes on but we're not going to talk anymore about this because um, a lot more goes on about what does a refugee do how do they manage in the country how did my parents manage to exist? How did they manage to exist? How did they manage to uh, forge a life for 
three little children. What kind of job, if they could get a job? How did they get the money? And then the story goes on even further. But this is all another story. How does a German, Aryan, wed a Jewish girl? What kind of life do they lead after in Britain? There is a story above a story above a story, which you all have stories to tell. If only you would write them down mm -hmm. or tell your children. It's so important to tell your children about it, even if they don't ask. Tell them about your, what you did. You know, even if you think it's mundane, it's not. So we all have stories to tell. And also, we need, we do need to contact our children more often, and they need to contact us, yeah? And say, this happened to me. Yeah, my mum didn't have a washing machine. She had to wa do her washing in the sink. That is an important thing. And I think we all know a little bit about that. Uh, to relay back to your children. And one more thing I want to say. Often when I'm giving talks uh, with school children, yeah, and somebody is standing there at the end and saying, what message have you got? What message have you got for these youngsters? I wonder what you would say. Has anybody got any ideas, please? Yeah. There's hope for you. Pardon? There's hope. Yeah. Be kind. Don't Pardon? Worry, be, be kind. kind. Be kind. You've hit the nail on the head. And don't be a bystander as well. <laughs> when I was literally about to say that. Sorry? <laughs> don't be a bystander. Yeah, when exactly. Was don't be a bystander. Yeah. Don't. Yeah? You see somebody in the road. Don't stand there. Help. Exactly. Acknowledge your differences. Acknowledge how prejudiced you are. And we are all prejudiced. And soon as we acknowledge our prejudice and our dislike, then we can deal with it. But only then we can deal with it. Yeah? Whether it's colour, whether it's social class, whether it's uh, religion, uh, whatever it is. As soon as we realise within ourselves this is part of us and it's a part of us that we don't like, part of me that I don't like, then I can acknowledge it and I can do something about it. Also, I say to the youngsters, the future is not easy for you. The future is yours. It is on your shoulders to make a better world for the world you are going to live in. It is yours. Not an easy task, but I'm sure you'll be able to deal with it. Okay, I'm going to end there, otherwise I'll... Thank you.